us here in person or online, we are so excited that you've taken the opportunity today to worship with us together here at Metairie Baptist Church. As we get started today, I just want to say as a, a way of thank you, thank you so much for the ministry that you've had as over the last several weeks, we've been collecting goods for the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. And if you haven't had an opportunity to do that so far, uh, we have a list on our church website that you can find, an exhaustive list of items that they will need. And uh, the, the bus is coming tomorrow morning to come pick those items up. So if you can gather them this afternoon and bring them here, I know that we would love uh, for you to be able to be a part of that ministry. Today we do have a special message from Dr. Perry Hancock, the Executive Director of the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. Hello to Dr. Thomas Strong and my friends at Metairie Baptist Church. I want to take this moment to thank you so much for your incredible support of our children through the Fall Food Roundup. I'm here at our food warehouse where we store all the gifts that your church provides for our children. With your support, we're able to provide all the food the children need for an entire year. Thank you again for meeting needs and changing lives at your Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. We participate in the ministry of the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home through the Fall Food Roundup. We get to have a tangible representation, a tangible gift to the many children and single mothers that are under the care of their ministry. So thank you so much for that ministry and what you've been able to do. But today we are excited to be in this place for this opportunity in this moment to be able to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So in just a few moments as the songs are sang, we, we invite you to join and worship with us. As the scripture is read, we, we ask you that you will just attune your hearts and your minds onto our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as an act of worship. And even as we pause in the midst of our service to pray and open up the word of God, we believe that these things truly are the things that changes hearts and lives. So whether you're a member, a regular attender, a first-time guest, we invite you today to worship with us. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then Destiny is going to lead us in our scripture reading for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be in this place, in this moment, to hear from you. And God, we plead with you to speak for your children are listening. God, I pray that your name is made famous in this place today. God, I pray that you hear the praises of your people. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, please listen as we read from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name and make his praise glorious. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Come and hear all who fear God. And let me tell you what he's done for me. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Please join us in worship. Yeah. 
I'm so glad to see you this morning. Uh, as has already been said, I just want to express to you my great appreciation for your willingness to be a part of the ministry of the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. And I thank you. I thank you for not only giving, but as we give, recognizing that suddenly their ministry becomes our ministry because we have a part in it. And it's one thing for us to say that we believe in what they do. It's another thing to actually put into practice that we believe. And so as we get ready to pray in just a moment, I would ask that you join me in praying for the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home, for Perry Hancock, and for all those involved. Now that that part of our ministry is coming to a close, not the children's home, but as far as collecting, you may be asking, what next? I'm glad you asked. We want to encourage you now to begin to pray on October 31st 
from 10 a.m. in the morning until noon. We're going to be having a fall festival here at the church. We had to make some adjustments because of all that's taken place. But our one goal, our one desire is to be able to do something at this place that demonstrates to the neighborhood, that lets us have an opportunity to demonstrate to them that we love them and that Christ loves them. That's the purpose of this time together. And so I'm going to ask you to begin now. There are four things you can do. One, you can bring candy. We need lots of candy. And if you were like me, I had the opportunity to go to Target yesterday. And my confession to you is I bought none because I knew if I bought it, I would eat it. But I want to encourage you to buy it and bring it here. And that way you don't have to eat about, you don't have to worry about eating it. But it helps us. We need help. We've always been able to give an abundance of candy. The second thing we need you to do is we need you to invite. We want people to know this is a perfect opportunity for you to be able to invite your neighbors, your family, people in our community. We're going to make sure they know. So make certain you do everything you can to help people know. Third thing we need, we need you. We need you as a part of the ministry. We believe this is a ministry. We believe that God can use this. He has in the past. We're confident he will this time. You can sign up. There was a link in the missive. We encourage you to sign up that way. You can see Dale. Dale can help you. But we're going to need some help. We need you to help us during that time. And most importantly, we need you to pray. We want you to pray that God would use this opportunity as we hand out candy. We're also going to be handing out uh, uh, some information that talks about what it means to have a personal relationship with Christ. We have some things the church is giving out. We want to make sure that we're allowing all those opportunities as an opportunity to plant seeds. And so we encourage you to pray, invite, give, and come. October 31st from 10 a.m. till noon. Will you be a part of the ministry? Will you pray for the ministry? Our hearts have been uh, burdened by all that's happened in southwest Louisiana. And certainly as we gather today, we pray for them. Uh, many of our friends who live in that area have barely recovered. Some have not even recovered. And now they've been hit by another storm. Many churches are not meeting today. Buildings are damaged, no electricity. Uh, pastors are frustrated. Church members are discouraged. And we just want to pray that God's going to lift them up. We're praying quite confident that he will because we know who God is. I'm also aware as we gather in a place like this today that you come with heavy hearts as well. There's probably somebody that's on your mind, on your heart, that's walking through a health issue, someone who's walking through decisions, someone who may have walked away from a, an intimate relationship with Christ, someone who doesn't know Christ. I promise you, we serve a God who is able to handle all of those and to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And so that's the reason we pray. And so I'd ask you to join me as we pray. Your heads bow and your eyes closed. In a moment of quietness, would you just take that which is upon your heart, and bring it to the Lord, a person, a concern for yourself, a challenge you're facing, someone who doesn't know Christ. Would you just lay that at the feet of Jesus and ask that Jesus would work as only he can? And then I'll lead us in prayer in a moment. Father, we, we confess what we've already sung, and that is, blessed be your name. There is no one like you. And we worship you, Father. We're amazed at your love for us. We're amazed at your consistent grace and kindness and compassion that we feel every day. And we know it's because of you, and we thank you. As we prayed earlier, Father, we ask you to bless the ministry of the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. We pray that you would do through that ministry what only you can do. And God, as we're anticipating your work here at this place, we pray that as we look toward the ministry of the Fall Festival, that it would be a time in which you use us for your honor. We're mindful, Father, that within walking distance of this place, there's a number of people who don't know you. There's a number of people who are discouraged. There's a number of people who feel like there's no hope. Use us, Father. Prepare the way. Make things work in such a way that you receive the honor you deserve. And Father, we pray for friends, people we don't even know who are in southwest Louisiana. We know they're struggling. We've experienced that. We ask God that in the quietness of the moment, 
the frustration of the day, those long nights, God, I pray you would just speak and remind them that you're very much there and that you have not stopped working. Comfort them and use us, Father. Use us through giving and through going, through donating. Use us to encourage them. Father, we just stand amazed at who you are. We know that you alone are worthy. And we pray, Father, that as we sing these words, that they would be words of praise and affirmation. May you speak to us as we continue to walk through this time, for it's in your name we pray. Is all creation growing? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he's David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this?
me as you're being seated in prayer. Father, thank you so much. We gather in this place and we recognize that there is no one like you. You are worthy. You are holy. And in your graciousness, you've given us your word. And in your love, you consistently speak to us. So during this time, Father, we pray you would open your word to us. We pray you would speak to us and allow us to hear with our hearts what you're saying to us so that we live more like you, so that we are a better reflection of your holiness and of your worthiness. Guide us as we go through this time, Father. We're listening for you to speak. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. During the past week, we read through the first two chapters of 1 Peter. And so I'd like to invite you to join us in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 9 in just a moment in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want to preach and talk with you these few moments we have about the importance of having the right mindset as we walk with Christ. Karl Barth is a well-known theologian, a great thinker. One time someone asked him, so what is the most profound thing you've ever discovered? In quietness, he sat there for a moment, tears filled his eyes, and then he spoke these words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The reality is, is that God's love for us is the most astounding thing. The fact that God has made a way for us to have a relationship with Him should overwhelm us. 
And it should impact how we live. It should make a difference, not just in our worship on Sunday morning, but in our worship all the time. What Peter wants us to do in this passage is he's writing to a church that's undergoing a tremendous persecution. Living for Christ is not easy. It's both challenging physically, it's discouraging, it's frustrating. They're living in a fallen world, and what Peter's trying to do is he's trying to encourage them You have been given a great gift in salvation. Now let it live out in all of your lives. He's trying to change their mindset. Listen as I read, beginning in verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Peter says this, he says, but you, by the way, he's speaking to those of us who know Christ. I'll go ahead and tell you this. In verse 9, there's a series of about 10 sermons. I'm going to spend two minutes here, so listen carefully, all right? In these opening words, Paul wants to, rem- or excuse me, Peter wants to remind us who we are. So he says this. He says, "You are a chosen race." There's a lot of description. There's a lot of conversation about this. But one of the things for sure, when he talks about us being a chosen race, he's reminding us that we are saved because God took the initiative. No matter what happened, it is God who did the work. It is God who reached out to us. We have been chosen to be in a relationship with Him, and there is no person who will ever be saved upon this earth without the initiative of God. And God has made a way, the Scripture tells us, for all people to be saved. And it happened because He started it. We are chosen individuals. He says, you're not only a chosen race, He says, you are a royal priesthood. Because we have a relationship with Christ, we don't have to depend upon somebody to walk into the presence of God But as children of God, we have the opportunity to go directly to God, to pray and to bring those things that are upon our hearts, to ask for forgiveness and to intercede for others. We're able to bring others into a relationship with Christ. He says we're also a holy nation. The word holy literally means that we are set apart. There's a circle. When you become a child of God, there is a circle that is drawn around you, and you are to be like no others because suddenly you are set apart because you're in a relationship with Christ. And I love this description. And then he says, and you are a people for his possession. And of all that God has created, those of us who know him as our personal Savior, he holds us close and he says, you know what? You are mine. The image is one of a father holding a child. The image is of a, even of a mother that's holding her newborn close. And God says, out of everything I've created, you are my special possession now i'll tell you if we ended the sermon right there that should be a a good moment where where we begin to discover what god has done for us but listen to what he says you are a chosen race you are a royal priesthood you are a holy nation you are god's special possession so that with the result that listen you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light Here's what Peter says, is that when we really discover who we are, we discover that the rest of our lives should be ones where we are consistently not talking about how good we are and not talking about what we've accomplished, but talking about how great a God. The songs that we've just sung, when we exclaim that He is worthy and that He is holy, those are not meant for 1030 on Sunday morning, but that is meant to be lived out in our lives every day. So that as we live for Him, people are consistently hearing about the one who called you and who called me out of darkness into this marvelous light that none of us deserve. We are, without question, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, not because of us, but because of Him. And Peter says we should be individuals who then spend the rest of our life singing praises to Him. He goes on, he says this, he reiterates it in verse 10. He says, once you were not a people. But now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. And so the question is, how do we live in such a way that we are individuals who are consistently singing the praises of God? I'm glad you asked, because he answers it. Listen to what he says next. Verse 11, he says this, dear friends. By the way, in the Greek, not to quibble, in the Greek, the word is beloved one. Loved individuals. You and I are in this special relationship with God because He has loved us. That moment when we accept Christ as our Savior, the moment we confess our sins, and we understand that what Jesus did for us on the cross, 
We enter into a new relationship with God, and he says to you, I call you loved ones, beloved ones. Then he gives this, these instructions. Listen. He says, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and they will glorify God on the day he visits. You know, I've discovered that the way you approach things, your mindset makes a difference. There are days when all of us wake up and the one thing we're thinking about is that we just want to get through the day. Have you ever felt that way? And generally, when we feel that way, we spend most of our days just getting through the day. What Peter wants us to understand is that we need to make sure that our mindset is such that we are not individuals who are just getting through the day, but that we are embracing what it means to be a chosen race a royal priesthood, a people for God's own position, a holy nation. And then we let that spill over into all of our lives. And in the passage that we're looking at today, he shows us four mindsets that we should have. And I want to encourage you, make note of these. Put them in your hearts and your minds and ask yourself, do these mindsets reside within my heart? Am I allowing God to let them live through me? First of all, he says this, we must have the mindset of a journey. We must have a mindset of a journey. Now you ask, where did that come from? Notice what he says. I urge you as strangers and exiles. Even in those brief words, what Peter wants us to understand is that you and I must always keep in mind that what happens upon this earth is just the prelude to eternity in heaven. And that as we walk upon this earth, as we live here upon this earth, that we do so with the reality that we may possess land and we may possess a house, we may have a home here upon this earth, but it is only for a short time that we will possess this place because this is not our eternal destination. Once we come to know Christ as our Savior, our eternity is secure, our destination is is determined and we discover that from that moment forward we are ultimately going home and until we go home we exist we walk upon this earth as a matter of fact the opening word where he says you are my beloved ones is a reminder that god is our father and this entire world we have the opportunity to live with god as our father but one day we'll be at home with our father Now, that doesn't mean, please hear me, it doesn't mean that we just endure. It doesn't mean that we don't appreciate or enjoy. I love life. I love many aspects of life. I love time with the family that God has given me. I haven't brought Audrey up in the sermon in a long time. I'm surprised I don't have pictures. If I thought about it, I would have. But uh, I would just tell you, I love being. Mike is off. There it is. I'll just scream louder. All right. Uh, you, could, you could hear me in St. Catharines if you wanted to. It's not going to stop me. All right. I have the opportunity to travel a lot at seminary. And one of the things I've discovered is when I check into a hotel, I never hang personal pictures. I never redo the furniture. And I don't paint the walls. You know why? I'm not there for any length of time. It's not mine. And you and I should be living as individuals who are on a pathway, on a journey where we're holding loosely to this life with the understanding that no matter what happens here, the priority is there. And we spend all of our time encompassed in what's taking place in this location, we may horribly find ourselves unprepared to meet Jesus Christ face to face. Here's the other thing we've discovered. If we hold loosely and we understand we're passing through, by the way, when Abraham was called, The scripture says that he passed through. He just went through land in order to get to the promised land. 
You and I are passing through, and as we do so, we hold loosely to the things here, and we discover that there's new joy in here because we recognize this is not all that there is, and God is doing an incredible work. When I was in the youth group, we were talking about this earlier. When I was in a youth group, you always had those songs that you sang, and they stuck in your mind. And one of those songs uh, back in the, um, gosh, in the 70s now, in the early 70s, uh, that we sang all the time as a song, This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Many of you probably know that. We sang that, and it was a reminder. This world is not it. We are on a journey. And so Peter says, you're aliens and you're strangers. Now listen carefully. He doesn't say you're strange. He says you're strangers, okay? I uh, don't give you permission. We've met a lot of strange people who are not heading anywhere. But he tells us we should be living as people who are not here for eternity. He goes on, he says, not only must we have the mindset of the journey, we must have the mindset of a battle. He tells us when you look at the second, and you uh, continue to look at the verse that we were Examining, he says, so I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Here's the reality, y'all. As we walk upon this earth, as we are heading toward eternity, as we are anticipating the day that we're going to meet Jesus Christ face to face. And by the way, if you're living the life that Christ has called us to live, that's not a day that you fear. It's a day that you long for, even as you embrace life here upon this earth. But as we live, the reality is, is that we face some very challenging times. And one of those challenges is that we're going to be tempted by Satan. Satan wants to derail us. He wants to detract us. He wants to distract us as we walk with him. And here's what Peter says. Fight the battle. Don't give up. So many times in this world in which we live, people think of sin as something that they can't resist, and so they give in. And here's what Peter says. Abstain from it. You know what abstain from it means? It means to push it away. It means you don't run toward it. You seen the proverbial carrot in front of a horse's face? You dangle a carrot in front of a horse, and the horse begins to walk in that direction. Satan's going to dangle things in front of you. He calls them lustful desires. And by the way, oftentimes it's associated with sexual desires. And it includes that, but it includes so much more. It's anything that causes you to simply want to take care of yourself. And here's what Peter says. Satan's going to dangle all those things in front of you. And instead of running to it, you say, no, you abstain from it. As a matter of fact, he tells us there's a war that's taking place. It's where you and I, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians, where we have to take every thought captive. Where we have to say, other people in this world may do that, but we live for Jesus Christ and we are heading to eternity with Him and we will not do that. You and I must understand that there is a battle. You read through the Bible, what you discover is that there are many giants in the Scriptures who fail because they didn't fight the battle. David, the great man of God, fell with Bathsheba because he didn't abstain from evil. Noah, the great man that God accomplished so much through. One of the last things we know about him is we see him lying in a drunken stupor. Elijah, the great man of faith, becomes a man whose faith wavered. Hezekiah, a godly king who changed the world in which he lived for good and for God, wound up at the end of his life consumed by passion and selfishness. They did not abstain. They didn't say, I will choose to live differently. They did not make a decision that they would come to a point in their lives where they would act like they are people who are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That's who we are. And now Peter says, act like it. Make certain that your life is a reflection of that. The third mindset you see is that we not only have a mindset of a journey and the mindset of battle, we also have the mindset of witness. As a matter of fact, when you read the passage, he says this in verse 12. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so when they slander you as evildoers, they will instead see your good works. Here's what Peter says. You and I should be living in such a way that the world around us has no accusation to make, and if they say something about it, about us, then they'll watch us and they'll go, oh, that's not true. 
That guy's not a liar. That guy's not a swindler. That guy's not unjust. That guy's not prejudiced. They can make accusations, but our lives instead will give a testimony that we are changed individuals. That's the reason he says in this passage in verse 12, beginning of verse 12, he says, conduct yourself. Live this way. Have you heard me say this before? It does matter how you live. Listen, here's where it begins. I could hammer you over the head from now to the time that I retire, whenever that may be. And I keep telling you, you got to do this. You got to live this way. You got to do this. You got to do this. The reality is, what Peter's saying is, he says, figure out who you are in Christ. That's the reason he started with, you're a chosen race. Once you figure that out, then you discover you want to live for God in such a way that you are consistently, as we saw earlier, lifting the praises of his name, not just on Sunday morning, and by the way, not in your car only, or your shower, wherever you do your singing, but instead all times, all of our life is lifting everything we do up to God to bring him praise as we live a changed life, as we conduct ourselves with integrity and honesty, and more so as we conduct ourselves as Christ lived. It does matter. This past week, a friend of our family passed away in Tennessee, and my mom and I were reminiscing about uh, his life. I first uh, met him because uh, we bought horses from him for our farm. And I know for most of you, kind of all those things seem kind of foreign to my life, and yes, they are. We lived on a farm. We had horses. Uh, uh, we had cows. Um, and then we went to the co-op, my, which, by the way, was equally foreign to me, uh, me and all my farmer friends in uh, Tennessee. Uh, which uh, So we're at the co-op, and we're buying stuff for the horse. And when we're buying stuff for the horses that we just bought, um, we bought a salt block. And I can remember as a little boy asking my dad, what are we doing this for? And we took the salt block and we put it near the water. And what we discovered is that the horse would lick the salt. And when the horse would lick the salt, then the horse would get thirsty and drink the water, which they needed to do. You and I are those salt blocks. Jesus tells us we're the salt. He tells us we're the light of the world. And we should be living in such a way that people say, by the way, not what's wrong with that person, but say, What's right with that person? Why are they living that way? And as they do so, then you know what we need to do? At that point, we open our mouths and we tell them what's different. I don't think Peter is ever giving us permission to say, well, I'm just going to witness by my lifestyle. But I'll tell you this, your witness must begin with your lifestyle and then it leads into you opening your mouth and telling other people, let me tell you how Jesus changed my life. I didn't figure this out myself. I'm not able to do this on my own. I met a man who claimed me as his special possession. And let me tell you about him. And so what he says is, whatever you do, live in such a way that you challenge people's lives. Live in such a way that you make them hungry to know who Christ is. Live in such a way that they don't ask questions about your integrity, but instead they ask questions about to whom you belong. By the way, I find it interesting. When you read 1 Peter, what you discover is that Peter's writing to a church that's undergoing a horrible persecution. They are dying for their faith. Life is difficult. And Peter doesn't give them permission to, to act any way they want to because life is hard. Here's what he's saying. It's even more important that you act right. So he tells them they must have the mindset of a journey. They must have the mindset of a battle. They must have the mindset of witness. And listen carefully. Listen to what he says at the end of verse 12. He says, conduct yourselves in such a way, last phrase, that they, the Gentiles, the pagans, will glorify God on the day that he visits. And I need you to listen real carefully. You and I must always have the mindset of impending judgment. We must always be individuals that are living in light of the fact Listen, one day, 
every single person. Some are going to do it when they die. Some of us are going to be here. Some people will be here upon the earth. Every single person is going to stand before God and give an account of their life. And what Peter is saying is this. In verse 12, is he's saying, you need to be conducting yourselves in such a way that they see something different in your life and that you have that opportunity to tell them about Christ so that when the people you come in contact with When they meet Jesus Christ face to face, they're ready. Listen, we spend so much of our time getting ourselves ready to face judgment that we forget we should be living always the life that Christ has called us to live so that there's no preparation necessary, but that we're helping other people along the way. And that we're not focused upon making certain we're ready. We're ready. We know Jesus Christ is our Savior. But what about your neighbor? What about the person you see at the restaurant? What about the person who checks you out when you make groceries? What about your spouse? What about your children? Because God's placed us here so that we could lift our lives as praise to him so that others would see it and that they would come to know and that as we go into eternity, get this, We walk into eternity and one day we kneel before Jesus because Paul tells us there's a day coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And some will be able to say Jesus is my Lord, but every person is going to recognize his Lord. And with our heads bowed before a holy God that day, we'll kneel before him and we'll profess Jesus is my Lord. We'll see our children. And we'll think how God gave us the opportunity to have an impact upon them. And they lived for Christ. They came to know him. And we'll hear our children say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And we'll hear our neighbors say that. And we'll hear that salty old person that we work with. Who's noticed something different because of the life that we live. So here's what Peter says. It really does matter. It matters how you live. Because we're having an impact upon other people being ready to meet Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you, a person's only saved because Jesus Christ reaches out to them and saves them. You cannot save anybody. But you and I should certainly be talking about Jesus and pointing people toward Jesus. We should always be living in such a way that Jesus is what draws people, that people are coming to him. seminary we've adopted our purpose statement we are preparing servants to walk with christ to proclaim his truth to fulfill his mission that purpose statement says as a faculty as administration this is what we do listen church this is what we do we walk with christ because we are his children and we want to be used by him help other people get ready to meet him face to face I also remind you of the simple truth the time here is short we may think someday we'll get around to it someday we'll make sure somebody knows about Christ or someday we're going to live for Christ you know as well as I do someday may never come So the scripture tells us to live in light of the fact that we're going to meet Jesus Christ, that we're on this journey, and as we walk on this journey, we're fighting a battle, and we desire to live in such a way that we never do anything to detract from the name of Jesus Christ, but instead we live to lift his name high in praises so that every person we come in contact with comes to know Christ as their Savior, and they'll be ready for the judgment. Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis said this. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It's since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world. Listen, y'all. We... We are a chosen race. God took the initiative. 
We're a holy priesthood. We can walk into the very presence of God and we can pray and intercede for others. We're a holy nation. There's something distinctive about us because Christ knows us. And we are His very possession. Man, live like it. That's what Peter says. Live like it. Because someday, someday we're going to see Him face to face. And what a great day that's going to be. Are you ready? Are you living? Today's the day. Would you join me as we pray? There may be some of you present today, perhaps some of you listening online, and you've never made a decision to follow after Christ. That's the beginning of it all. It comes from understanding that Jesus died for us. And the reason he died for us is to pay the penalty for our sins. He died upon the cross because of me and you. And when he died, he took care of it. It is paid in full. And the scripture tells us now we are to repent and believe. Repent, turn away from our old way of life, turn toward Jesus, ask him to forgive us of our sins, and follow him the rest of our lives. Let him guide our hearts. If you've never made that decision, that is without question the most important decision you'll ever make. And that's the beginning of a relationship with Christ. But I know today in this place, I'm speaking to many people who know Christ. So let me ask you, in the quietness of this moment between you and God, are you living as if your eternity is in heaven and not here on earth? Are you fighting the battle that God's called you to fight so that you can be the person he wants you to be? Are you conducting yourself in such a way that your witness is consistent every single moment? You're being used by God in such a way that you're helping other people avoid the judgment of separation of God forever. Perhaps today in the quietness of this moment, perhaps you just want to cry out if you already know God. You want to cry out, God, that's my desire. I hear you. Help for my mind to be that way. Help for me to live that way. That's who I want to be. Father, I thank you. I thank you we gather in this place that you're a God who's still reaching out and still calling people to yourself and today I pray you would do that I thank you for that for those of us who've heard your call and responded that today we bow before you as your your chosen nation a royal priesthood a holy nation your own possession I pray you'd help for us to live in light of that convict us convince us help us understand the greatness of knowing you Father, speak to us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to join us in standing. And as you stand, I'm going to ask you to sing this song. But I'm going to ask you to let the words be a reflection of a commitment that you make. A decision to follow after Christ. Don't mouth the words. But let this be the cry of your heart. I have decided to follow Jesus. seated briefly today you may need to make a decision and I don't know what that is maybe it's a decision to follow Christ for the first time maybe today is the time that you just need to get real before God and, and, and recommit your life to him in a new and a fresh way in just a moment if you're here worshiping with us in the building when you exit the building and walk around Thomas and others will be there and they'd love to talk with you 
about the things that God's laid on your heart. Maybe you're watching online or today you don't have the moment to, to wait to talk. If you'll email us at connect at metairiebc.org or call our church office 504-835-2611. We'll make sure to get back in touch with you. One decision that has been made, we've had multiple decisions that have been made at Metairie Baptist since we've come back from the pandemic. We've had uh, those who have committed their lives to Christ and those who have committed their lives to the service of uh, our Lord here at Metairie Baptist Church. And today, I want to introduce you to two more, Robert Caruso and Ann Blanchard. They're engaged to be married in December. Robert's been at the seminary for a couple years now, and they have decided to make this their church home. So I know that you want to be praying for Robert and Ann the days ahead as we seek to make a difference here in Metairie and beyond. A couple things of just business here. If you're uh, watching online, there'll be a link in the comments in just a second. If you're worshiping here with us, on your way out today, there is a deacon nomination form for us to uh, nominate a new slate of deacons for the new year. So I know that you will want to think through those men that God have laid on your heart and to nominate them. Two other things. This week, we're going to be releasing a, a new study called On the Way, a study through the Gospel of Mark uh, that Thomas has been recording. They're going to be on Facebook and YouTube. We'll also put them in the Missive Weekly. There are about 15-minute videos that you can watch uh, with your Bible open, ready to study the Word. Uh, I was joking with them a while ago. I think it took them about five sessions to get through Mark 1. So it's an in-depth study. So make sure that you watch that. Take the time to study through Mark together with us. And then finally, next week, next Sunday evening, we're having uh, our monthly family meeting where we're going to be talking specifically about Fall Fest, but also some other things that are taking place in the life of our church. So I know that you'll want to be, with, uh, be here for that. We're glad you're here. Let us pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And God, with our minds set on you, I pray today, Lord, that we leave this place with your gospel message in our heart and on our lips as we encounter those around us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much.